Hi everyone, my name is Matt Williams. I am a tutor in politics at the University of Oxford. I'm also what's known as the Access Fellow of Jesus College, which is one of the colleges that makes up the university. Today I'm going to talk to you about how we choose students. It's a really important part of the university and it's fair, I think, for you if you're a prospective applicant or indeed if you've already applied to have a little bit more information about how we actually decide between the fantastic applicants that we receive. Now, just as a bit of background to myself, I've been involved for about 10 years in admissions for PPE, that's philosophy, politics and economics, and history and politics, two of our most competitive undergraduate degrees at the University of Oxford. But I've also been on the other side. When I was 17, I applied uh, to study at the University of Cambridge and I was rejected there. Um, in fact, I was rejected by a guy who then went on to become my boss at Oxford and I covered his teaching for a few years. The reason I'm telling you that is not because I sort of somehow stalked him and committed an act of sort of cold-blooded revenge on him for rejecting me as a 17-year-old at Cambridge. No, the reason for telling you this is because I've just got a bit of personal experience as to what it's like to have been rejected, but also then go on to be a tutor and make decisions that have led to other people being rejected. So I've been rejected and I've done rejecting. And it's awful. It's the worst part of the job. And I think it's fair that prospective applicants understand a little bit about the technicalities of how we actually do it. In other words, what is our decision algorithm? How do we actually fairly prosecute uh, an admissions process? How do we actually fairly make sure that we take the right students? It's incredibly difficult, but I'll go into some of the details as to what we do do and also what we don't do in this video. If you want a bit more information about rejection and what that might mean and how to sort of manage the psychology around that, I will link a video up in the corner here that I published last year, which speaks about my own story of being rejected and how I think students should try to manage their feelings of rejection. The headline being that it really doesn't matter and you shouldn't regret applying or feeling like a reject if you've applied to a competitive university. Anyway, the, the, the motivation for making this video is because decision day is coming up. So on Tuesday the 11th of January 2022, the University of Oxford will send out decisions that it has made on admissions. So we will have received around 23,000 applications for undergraduate degrees at the university and of those applicants about 4,000 will be informed that they have been offered a place. So that's about 17% or roughly one in six but that's on average so across all of our degree programs but of course the competitiveness rate is different for different degrees. Degrees like medicine, law, economics and management are much more competitive than other degrees are so that's an average. Nonetheless, the point being that it is, as you would, I'm sure, anticipate, highly competitive to apply and be successful and offered a place at the University of Oxford. And I think it's important to note that regardless of what happens in your own application, you must be very proud of yourself. It takes a lot to get yourself to the level of being competitive at one of the world's best universities. And that's something to be proud of. You know, it's not that far-fetched to say that it's akin to putting yourself up for anything else that's particularly elitist. You know, if you're going for something like an, an elite military force, or if you are aiming to be the top uh, flight in a particular sport, you're getting into a similar sort of comparator of how competitive you are pushing yourself. And so whether or not you are successful in your specific application, is kind of immaterial. You, you know, you're already a hero for even applying. You're already an exceptional, an exceptionally bright, and exceptionally capable human being. And you ought to be very proud of yourself. And I hope that you are. And also, you will be stronger as a result of the application. So the application helps people develop their skills even further, regardless of whether or not they are admitted. Okay, and if you are successful or unsuccessful in obtaining a place or an offer of a place at the University of Oxford, you can obtain feedback. So if you'd like to know what happened to your application in more specific detail, contact the college that you were assigned to and they will be able to give you more specific feedback. Okay, but in this video I'll talk quite generally about how we make our decisions. So first of all, it's probably instructive to start with what we don't factor into any of our decisions. So we've got a decision algorithm, we've got 23,000 applicants, so we've got to whittle that down to about 4,000 offers. How do we compute that? How does that calculation operate? Well, there are various things that we don't consider. And basically, we don't consider anything that is not relevant to your academic ability and potential. So academic ability and potential is basically everything to our, our decision algorithm. 
still a bit woolly, still a bit vague. So what does that not mean? It's quite useful if I just exclude certain things that we will not take into consideration under any circumstances for you to understand what we do then find as useful data, as actionable data, if you like. We don't, for example, think that your school type is relevant. So there's a bit of a perception in the UK that Oxford is biased in favour of certain schools, in particular fee-paying independent schools, sometimes confusing you referred to as public schools because of a piece of legislation from the 19th century. Anyway, don't worry about it. Basically, the, the, the presumption is that we, we prefer students who come from these sort of expensive, quite elite schools. The truth is we don't. We don't have any bias in favour or disfavour of any particular schools because it's not relevant to your academic ability and potential. There is a caveat to that, however, which is that we do contextualise your school performance. In other words, we look at how well you've done at school relative to that school, relative to your area and relative to your socioeconomic background. So that tends to favour people that are underrepresented. It tends to favour people that have gone to schools that rarely send students to universities like Oxford, students that have come from relatively poor backgrounds. So that's the only time when school type becomes relevant because we consider all things being equal, that someone who has applied to Oxford from a more difficult, less advantaged background is likely to have certain strengths of character and capacity that other more privileged applicants may not have simply through not having emerged out of the, the same context. So that's the only time in which school type becomes relevant is that we contextualise your school, your performance relative to your school. But otherwise we don't have any biases in favour or against any particular school type. So it's, I'm afraid, a myth that we somehow prefer students that went to elitist fee-paying schools. Okay. Another thing, just expanding on that, is that we don't actually consider any of your individual characteristics of relevance at all. Now hopefully you'd anticipate this, but I think it's worth just being absolutely clear on this point. In other words, it's of no interest to us and it's of no relevance to our admissions decisions as to your skin colour or your religion or your sexual orientation or your gender or anything like that. It's just not relevant. It doesn't speak to your academic ability and potential and we don't factor it into our admissions decisions at all, okay? As I say, hopefully that was obvious, but it's worth spelling out. We also don't consider your wealth of any relevance. Um, so whether or not you come from a, a wealthy family or a very poor family doesn't factor into our, our admissions decisions, except again, as mentioned previously, that we do recognise that some people come from particularly disadvantaged backgrounds. And in order to try and widen participation amongst those people at universities like Oxford, we will acknowledge and contextualise their exam performance, uh, given the fact that they are applying from a relatively underprivileged background. But otherwise, how wealthy you are is irrelevant. If you are from absolute poverty, if you are homeless, that has no bearing on your application. And similarly, if you are extremely rich, that again has no bearing on your application. Okay. We also don't factor in legacy. Now, legacy is something that is sometimes utilised for admissions decisions at US universities. And what it means is that whether or not you have someone within your family that attended the same university. So it could be that, let's say, your mother went to Oxford and therefore that might implicate your capacity to get into Oxford. It actually doesn't have any bearing whatsoever. So even if you're the first person in your family ever to apply to a university, let alone Oxford, it won't factor in. It's not relevant, we don't gather those data, we just don't know. Um, so again, that is not relevant at the University of Oxford. We also don't consider anything to do with your extracurriculars, being those things that are extra to your curriculum, so extra to your academic interests. So that could be, for example, sport. Let's say you're, you're terrific, you're a world-class sports person. I'm afraid that's not going to help you at all. It's not relevant to our degree programmes and therefore it's not going to help you get in. Um, so extracurriculars, which again can be of importance at American universities, have no bearing on our admissions decisions at the University of Oxford. The things we do consider, well, as mentioned, are pertaining to your academic ability and potential, but what that specifically means is all of the data that we gather. And we gather those data over four months. We have a pretty extended 
admissions process and that's because we get so many fantastic applicants we've got to spend the time and the due diligence making sure that we got all of the best possible data so we do uh, as as mentioned consider your school grades but we can textualize those grades so we don't compare your grades relative to the rest of the united kingdom we compare them relative to your school so we one of the best performers in your school if your school has been struggling for several years that's not your fault so we consider your performance relative to the school especially with regards to GCSEs and in particular in recent years with regard to centre assessed grades which have been used as a result of the pandemic we do contextualise those so we don't just sort of look at the raw data we don't just look at the letter or numerical grades and say all right well you're you're this ranking in the whole united kingdom because that wouldn't be a very good assessment of your academic potential so we assess your potential relative to your context which is the fairest way of doing it we also look at your predicted grades so if you have qualifications that you haven't completed yet if, for example, you're midway through your A-levels, then we'll look at predictions. But again, we're aware that some schools predict more or less generously than others. And so we take those predictions and we contextualise them again. So we're always trying to be very cautious. We're not just looking at the, the number grade you've got, the letter grade you've got, and just assuming that that gives us all the information. We also try and contextualise those data. And hence why you know, we spend quite a lot of time in the admissions process and we take a lot of care with it. We also look at your personal statements and, and uh, the references that will be written on your behalf by your teachers in the UCAS application form. We will consider the results you obtained in any admissions tests. Now, often admissions tests, if they are used for your degree programme, will be amongst the most level of playing fields available because that is relatively clear data by which we can compare all of the applicants that we've received for a particular programme. Now, again, sometimes admissions tests uh, encounter various problems. It could be that the test centre you took the test in uh, was had some sort of difficulties and technical difficulties that may have affected your performance and we will consider that as part of the admissions process but nonetheless the admissions test tends to be one of the most level of playing fields and therefore typically has a slightly greater weight applied to it when it comes to making decisions between excellent applicants we will also consider any submitted work if that was part of your application it's not for many of our degrees, but it is for some. And then, of course, we look at interviews. We interview all students that will go on to be offered a place at Oxford. And so the interview is a very important part of our decision algorithm. OK, so I've given you a sort of very general perspective on how we try and determine who are the, who are the better uh, candidates. But how do we actually make final decisions? Because the, the thing to note is that all of the applicants are brilliant. Right? I, I've never come across, oh, I very rarely come across, I should perhaps say, uh, applicants that I thought had no chance, right? The vast majority of the applicants, you know, 99.5% are, are brilliant. And the reason we can't take more is not because we don't want to take more, it's because actually the city council won't allow the university to expand anymore. We're already putting quite a lot of pressure on public services. So we are capped on the number of students we can take. So it's not that we're sort of saying, well, there are 4,000 that can make it and the others really don't stand a chance. No, it's that we could probably take pretty much every applicant and they would thrive. So then the question becomes, well, how do you decide? If you've got this sort of slate of fantastic candidates, on average six applicants for every available place, how do you choose? How do you particularly choose? Well, we consider all of those data that I just described, all of the data that we've got on your academic ability and potential, and we, we assess them relative to each other and relative to all of the applicants so that we get a good sense of your position within the application pool, okay? The differences that emerge from that assessment tend to be absolutely minute. So it, as mentioned, it's not like there's a sort of a chasm between good applicants that we'll accept and bad applicants that we will reject. No, no, no. It's tiny, tiny differences. And so what we have to do is that the tutors will come together and they will make decisions on who to select. And there will have been lots of tutors involved in the admissions process and they will conference together and they will come up with the decisions as to who ought to be offered a place and who regrettably will not be offered a place. What it tends to come down to is that some of the most decisive factors will often be with regards to teachability. And this is something that is specifically tested for at the interview. And teachability 
can be summarized in a few ways. It's basically your sort of suitability for the Oxford tutorial process, which is the way we teach. And we're looking for students that are able to think out loud. So willing to just share their thoughts out loud. It doesn't mean that you have to be a very self-confident, self-possessed person. It just means that you're willing to share your thoughts out loud. So someone that did that well in the interview is likely to have performed more strongly. We're also looking for people that are able to contribute. So are willing to try and resolve academic intellectual problems. They're not going to shy away from a challenge. They're not going to sort of sit on a fence necessarily, they will try and resolve those puzzles and that again will have been tested by the interview. And finally we look, and depending on the subject, but we often look for what, what can be described as independent mindedness. So it's relatively easy to find a solution to an academic or intellectual problem that somebody else has offered, but we quite like to note people that are trying to offer their own thoughts, that aren't just necessarily saying what others say, but they're really trying to think for themselves. So when it comes down to sort of the minute differences between applicants, those aspects of what is broadly described as teachability often come into play. When we're sort of really working out who to take amongst an incredibly strong applicant pool, it's those people that will particularly benefit from the Oxford tutorial system. Which is not to say that the people we don't accept would have completely floundered in that environment at all. Like I say, the differences are tiny. And so if you're not offered a place, it doesn't mean that you weren't capable, it doesn't mean that you're not intelligent, it just means that there wasn't space for you. That is literally all it means. And it can come down to a bit of luck. I mean, sometimes people talk about Oxbridge admissions as being a lottery, with the implication being that we just shove everyone's applications into a sort of huge tombola and then we pull them out at random. It isn't like that, it's not a lottery, but luck is involved because what comes up in admissions tests, in interviews, can suit your strengths or might actually not be towards your strengths and so it may come down to tiny little differences like that even as i often mention in my videos how well slept you are how well fed you are before a particular engagement before an admissions test before an interview could make the difference right i mean the difference is just that tiny it is like the difference between incredible athletes competing at the highest level. It's not going to be a huge gap between the race winners and the and those that come in lower uh, positions. It's going to be tiny, tiny, tiny margins of difference. So what are some final thoughts? Applying to Oxford, regardless of what happens, will make you a better thinker. It's good for you, right? It doesn't matter if you're not admitted. It won't make you a worse person. In fact, the whole process will make you stronger. So if you're on the fence about whether to apply, go for it, would be my, my advice. It does you no harm and it only does you good. So I would say give it a try. It takes a lot of guts to apply and so you should be very proud of yourself regardless of the outcome. Making the decisions on who to admit and who not to admit is very difficult. I'm not trying to seek your sympathy on that. We it's our job, and we take a great deal of care over it. As I say, the admissions process for Oxford University takes four months and engages hundreds and hundreds of staff across the university to make sure that we make the fairest possible decisions. But the point I'm trying to make here is that, and I've made this point several times now, is that pretty much everyone who applies to Oxford could, could make it at Oxford, could th flourish. It comes down to absolutely tiny differences. So if you're not offered a place don't take it as some sort of mark, sign that you are intellectually incapable, not at all. And also remember that you know sometimes the knockbacks in life are what really define life. It's what really makes you stronger. You know when I was rejected by Cambridge as a seventeen-year-old, I just sort of said, "Fine, well, you know I was applying for the wrong degree, as it happens. Um, I wasn't really that engaged intellectually. I wasn't doing enough reading around the subject." And I thought, well, I'll go to another university, I'll go to the University of Bristol and I'll show them wrong. They were wrong. And, and I did. And I you know, came top of the year at Bristol and I pushed myself in part because of the rejection from Cambridge. I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder, if I'm, if I'm brutally honest. And I wanted to show them that I thought they'd made a mistake. And like I mentioned at, uh, earlier, the person that, I, uh, that rejected me from Cambridge then became my boss at Oxford and I covered his teaching for two years and now he's a friend and colleague. So, you know, the, the thing is that I don't regret that rejection. It made me stronger. Um, I'm grateful for it, right? If I'd been admitted to, to Cambridge at 17, it might have just instilled in me this sort of slight sense of, um, I don't know, 
uh, complacency, intellectual sort of laziness. I'm not saying that people that get admitted to Cambridge and Oxford are like that, but that might have been the effect on me. I might have just thought, well, I've made it now. I've got nothing to struggle with. I've got nothing to prove. Whereas I kind of, I think, was becoming more mature as I was uh, growing up uh, as a 17, 18 year old. And I needed that sort of extra boost to keep me going. And so being rejected from Cambridge is probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my life. Okay, so just be aware of that. And effectively, you shouldn't fear rejection. I mean, a re rejection is a fundamental part of life. It's a fundamental part of succeeding. You know, people that strive to do difficult things will be knocked back many, many times. And the key is how you evolve from that, how you develop a, a good coping strategy. You need to be incredibly good at being rejected and moving on because that's I'm afraid a part of life but it's actually not something to be afraid of it's just it makes for the story of life much more interesting if everything was just a seamless narrative of endless successes it would make a really dull novel if you were to novelize such a thing so don't sort of fear rejection don't not engage with things don't not apply for things because you might be rejected because if you go down that way of thinking you might as well just live in a cave and never engage with anyone in your life and that's clearly not a way to live Anyway, hopefully this has given you some insight into how we make decisions, especially these incredibly difficult admissions decisions. If you have any further questions, as ever, do please uh, put them in the description, uh, in the comment section below, and I'll get to answering them as quickly as possible. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this has been helpful. Keep in touch. Stay safe. Look after yourself. All the best. Thanks. Bye.